Welcome everyone. My name is Mark and I'm here on behalf of Advanced Assembly and Summit Interconnect. And we are here to present a very exciting webinar with my friend, Mike Jupi. Mike is a thermal design expert who has had hands in designing a lot of boards, uh, mill aero, all sorts of stuff that I'm sure he's not allowed to talk about due to NDAs. He's gonna talk about them anyway. He might lie, he might tell the truth. We don't know, it's all hidden by NDAs. Um, but Mike has been on a journey with me now for, for several months where we've been covering various aspects of thermal PCB design. And if you look at the links below in the webinar descriptions on your YouTube or LinkedIn page, you'll see links to those other webinars. We should have two uh, webinars and then one hack chat transcript where we were over on hackaday.com. So with that, Mike, please introduce yourself to people who might be joining us uh, for the first time today and tell us a little bit about what you've been teaching. Well, Mark, thank you very much for the opportunity again to come out and share some of the information I've been trying to get out to people. Uh, so I'm a mechanical engineer and I specialized in heat transfer. I primarily worked in the aerospace industry. I also had a, a segment of time where I worked for a print circuit board manufacturer. Uh, it was uh, Cortec, and Cortec was later purchased by uh, TTM and I think a number of others. But anyway, I had time with uh, Cortec, and I, during that time period, I was out uh, giving a lot of presentations and talking about the work that I had started back in 1999 on uh, trace heating. And I'd written a few papers and eventually became the chairman of the task group that wrote IPC 2152. And there was uh, a problem that I ran into on a, a satellite called Stardust. I was working on the electronics that was managing current coming in from the solar arrays, distributing that, that current to power batteries as well as power of the electronics. And I ran into, uh, well, it turned out this was about 1996. And uh, I started doing thermal analysis in 1982. And this was the first time uh, on this design where the electrical engineer had given me power for the electrical traces on the circuit board. And the power was significant. And that power changed the design. Wow. When I called when I called IPC to ask them about these charts, because in at the time it was um, um, the mill standards were being transferred over to IPC. IPC being a industry consortia that was working with a bunch of corporations. Everyone volunteers their time to improve the industry standards, which were now becoming a part of what the manufacturing world. And the corporations that used them, it was up to the corporations to maintain those standards. And uh, prior to that, the National Bureau of Standards was doing all of the work. And the work, eventually, what I'd found out is that the uh, work that went into these design charts, the charts that people now find in IPC 2221, dated back to 1955. And it was work that was funded by the Navy, the U.S. Navy, and print circuits were just a new industry that was coming up. And the uh, military wanted to have better information for sizing electrical traces. And so they ran this a series of studies over several years, and they came up with some design charts or a design chart, uh, which we'll talk about here in a bit. And uh, once I found out what went into that, it inspired me to go and chase it and come up with better information for people to work with, which ended up resulting in IPC 2152, which is the standard for determining current carrying capacity and printed board design. So there's an intro for you. <laughs> quite, quite an intro it is. And this is also something of an outro for you too, right? This is your last last exposure to the uh, of this information to the world before you retire and go enjoy your art and become an expert at that well i've been retired for a couple of years and it was reading about some of the comments i was seeing out on the net where people were 
not having such great opinions about IPC 2152. And I felt that it was really just ignorance on the part of others that they didn't understand what the standard was all about and what its purpose was, and which was not, you know, well advertised. And if you weren't a part of generating the standard, uh, IPC did not do much for marketing or getting information out about it. Certainly didn't ask me to do anything on that realm. So uh, it's understandable that people wouldn't necessarily understand the purpose behind it, uh, but that's what uh, I've come back out to talk about so that when people use these standards, they have a little bit better idea of what they represent and also give them a little bit of a vision as to where they can go with the standard, spe specifically IPC 2152, or use the information that it is in IPC 2221 better than what they currently are if they don't understand where it comes from. And we'll talk about that. All right. Well, hey, let's jump right in, shall we? All right. So you want to go right. to that first presentation? We'll just bump on through there. This one, sir? That's it. So we'll, we'll move on from there since we've already had an intro. Looks like uh, we might be blocking the bottom of the screen. I'm not sure. Let me see if there is something I can do about that. I can do oh, this. That looks much better. Okay. All right. So as I mentioned, I, I'm a mechanical engineer. I specialized in heat transfer. I was the chairman of the uh, standards committee for putting that standard together, IPC 2152. And I, I worked with that group from 1999 to 2017. It was in the year 2000, I uh, teamed with the University of Colorado Denver to uh, set up a lab. We wrote a National Science Foundation grant proposal, hoping to get funding to do the work that uh, we felt needed to uh, create the design charts that would eventually go into 2152, but we didn't get the funding. So I ended up purchasing all of the lab equipment from the university and uh, set up a lab at my house. And I hired two students and we went off and started collecting data and creating design charts. And from there, I teamed with a, a company, a software company, and we created a database tool that would allow us to manage all of the data that we are collecting. In addition, we created a process where we, we would use the test data that we had and create computer models of those uh, test configurations, and then use computer models to generate additional design charts. And from that, we ended up making a lot of design charts and then implementing them into this tool. And that tool we sold online uh, through my company, and we sold to a number of companies, uh, but it just wasn't enough to stay afloat. So we shuttered everything in 2004 and here we are at 2022, and I'm just trying to bring some clarity to 2152 and 2221. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to really illustrate and what got me interested in pursuing these additional charts is to look at the original data that people were using for sizing electrical traces. And that is in a National Bureau of Standards report. And in that report, we can see uh, some of the test boards and we can talk about that here. So Mark, if you switch over to that other, there we go. Now, unfortunately that's quite the eye chart and we aren't gonna be able, <laughs> sorry folks, but uh, Mark, this presentation you'll be able to download or make available to folks, right? Yeah, absolutely, we will. Uh, I, uh, I don't think I can do that today, um, but I can definitely get that done this week. Cool. So the eye chart on the left are all of the different board configurations that were uh, used when the National Bureau of Standards was doing the testing. And when folks can download this for their own purposes, uh, take a look at each of the columns. The first column on the left is uh, just a designator, uh, a numeric designator. And those numeric designators show up on the chart on the right hand side uh, you'll notice that i've put in the letters o uh, l and j 
And those letters represent uh, three different board configurations. You also notice that on the I chart on the left-hand side, there's uh, a column uh, in the middle there that talks about the core and the thickness. And in there, you'll also see a K next to it or a double K. And the K and double K represent, uh, the double K represents a board that is copper clad. So there were traces on one side of the board and a copper plane on the other side of the board. So of the test boards, there was a mix of different board thicknesses You'll see in there that they describe them as 1 32nd inch thick, 1 16th inch thick, 1 8th inch thick, and it, then it either has a K or a double K on it. The double Ks are, have a, a copper plane on the backside. The single K have no copper planes. And what, the, what you end up seeing when you look at the data on the right-hand side, and what you're looking at right here is in the appendix of IPC 2152. So if you have a copy or you can get a copy, uh, these, this, the table on the left and the chart on the right are included in that appendix. We're, we included the appendix in 2152 as a purpose of uh, allowing people to have uh, the history behind the charts that preceded IPC 2152. And so if you look at that letter L, what that, the, the L designates a board that was 03, it's a 132nd inch thick board. So it's 03 inches thick or 79 millimeters thick. And that being a, that's a, so that's a thin board relative to the other two. And you'll see that now on the chart on the right, another thing I have to explain is that all of these curves and all of these data points represent a 20 degree C rise when they applied current to the trace. So the, there are multiple traces, all of those O's, all of the L's, each of the letter designators were different size traces on the same board. Okay. And <clears throat> L shows you what the temperature rise so the 20 degree temperature rise you can uh, unfortunately you can't see the current very well on the left hand side but it's a lower current that gives you a 20 degree c rise for a similar size trace as on a board that's th the same thickness and has a copper plane on the back and you can also compare it to a thicker board that uh, also has better heat transfer characteristics so you've got what you're seeing here is a board. <laughs> it's really, I'm going to have to switch over to my computer to figure to out read. what the O, J, and L are. Hang on one second here. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that is a little taxing on the eyes. I, I have it up on a 32 so, inch right now so I can see it. <laughs> so O, if you, if you make a little note here for me, Mark. Sure. O, O is the thin board, O thirty second, one thirty second, thin board with the copper clad on the back. J is two ounce copper, and it's the thick board but no copper plane. And then L is the thin board, one thirty second, but no copper plane. Okay. All right. Any others? Well, we'll just work with that. I mean, I, people can go through and look at this. It's pretty interesting if you actually go through it because you can gain a lot of information. Uh, you can see how much current you can actually run through that size trace. And if you, you plot these data points yourself, you can gain a, a lot of information. You get to know board the influence of board thickness. You get to know the influence of uh, this distance between a trace and a copper plane and how much lower the temperature rise would be for a given current level. Uh, unfortunately, you know, some of these boards were phenolic, which and there aren't too many people designing with phenolic. The triple XP represents phenolic and the other boards are epoxy. Uh, but anyway, by looking at that, you see that the impact of 
of copper planes in a board. And you also see the impact of board thickness. And so as board, thicker boards can handle a little bit more power, they spread power better. And so you have a lower temperature rise. When you've got a copper plane, it spreads the power, it spreads the temperatures out and you get a lower temperature rise. And the thinner boards with no copper, they're restricted by the dielectric material. And the thinner boards, the thinner the boards that you have, the less area you have for spreading heat. And so therefore the temperatures are higher. So as a general rule of thumb, thin boards are hotter than thick boards. Boards with copper planes are certainly going to be running cooler. And, and we'll look at some of the data. And then the biggest takeaway that I want people to have is that parallel conductors, uh, there's, you, you have to take into account the fact that if you've got traces that are running either side by side or up above or below you know, the vicinity of a single trace, those traces all contribute, if they all have current running through them, they're all contributing to the overall temperature rise that's going to occur when they're all powered up. And the parallel conductor rule is supposed to address that, but it's not a simple thing to apply. We're gonna go through a little exercise here in a little bit, but uh, you know, it is a general rule. The easiest way to manage parallel conductors in my mind is to manage the power dissipation itself and look at power density. And that's where these design charts come in really handy is that if you have a chart that actually matches your technology and how you mount your board, then now you have a, another early tool in the pre-design process to look at power and power density and understand a little bit better as to what kind of a temperature rise you should expect on, a, on your own technology through those design charts. All right. So I'm gonna look at one more here. So this uh, chart, is the old external uh, chart that went into IPC 2221. And you'll notice I've got it circled up on top, the word tentative. Mm -hmm. So that's the way this chart was uh, published back in 1956 when they finished the work. And it was never intended to go out and be used as a single design chart because the guys that had done the work actually stated in the report that there was further studies that they wanted to do before they published anything. So they labeled this tentative, but they never got funded. So this existed until IPC 2152 came out. <laughs> That's crazy, Mike. I'm going to put that on the screen too. <laughs> that the world needs to know. I think it's pretty cool to know that, you know, I think it's pretty cool that you went to like the Library of Congress and figured this out for us. I, I, National Archives had the National had the, Archives. I'm sorry. Yeah. So let's go over to the uh, other uh, presentation. We'll start going through that. So when I found you know this this report and I could see the, all the variables that were impacting trace temperature rise. Uh, I went off to do a bunch of other work to supplement. Uh, what was going on with I, IPC 2152. But what I want people to realize that IPC 2152 is really just a baseline configuration, represents a data point for each copper weight for the charts that are in uh, the, the document 2152. And there's two environments, one's for still air and one's for vacuum. And that testing was done using a board that was 14 inches by seven inches and 07 thick, had no copper planes in it. It's suspended in air or suspended in vacuum. And that is all, all the work that was done to collect the data that went into the design charts was performed following the test method, uh, IPC test method 650, 2.5.4.1a. And that test method describes how to go about doing the testing. And that's what we followed uh, to collect the data that went into all the design charts that we created. And so, as I recall, well, Mike, the, um, the test methods aren't behind a paywall like the standards are, correct? I don't know, but I have found this particular one out on, on the net before. Sorry, I'm muting myself. I've got a cat over here screaming the songs of his people. <laughs> 
Yeah. So the other thing I wanted to mention is that it doesn't make any sense to have one design chart for all board configurations out in the world. And so that was not the intention of IPC 2152. Uh, it was meant to give more information for doing computer modeling. And the, the modeling is, is where you gain the most power for being able to understand your own designs. So, so what, I, what we did was we correlated our computer models to the test data that was collected for the charts in IPC 2152. And then we just started working with that, those models to add you know, copper planes or change the size or add you know, even mounting configurations, which is where we were going, but we, we never were able to uh, finish that part. But we were, we were able to create 68 different design charts and 17 of those design charts that we put into our database were just from test boards. So we have a lot of test boards. Uh, you know, I've got some here, I had pictures, but I don't know if you can see this. Oh, wow. Let me make you a big here. One second. Okay. Um, how do I do it? Nope. That's me. We're close, Mike. We're close. <laughs> so here's one test board. You know, this is the 14 by seven by 07 polyimid board. And then here's a, FR4 board that we looked at, you know, it's just okay, traces, wow. just, and then there's a, we'd ran it and then it created some small little test boards for doing high current pulses. And they were pretty cool. Let's see that again, Mike. I found a way to make it bigger. Oh yeah. So this was for doing high current pulse testing. How did you measure the temperatures on these, Mike? Oh, that's even a longer story. So oh, okay. everything. <laughs> Sorry. Well, in the test method, here's the last one. And you can see this one we're going to talk about. This is for a parallel trace study. So you notice how this, it's a serpentine pattern. I, I do. With It looks exactly. like test points in the middle. Yeah. So are you familiar with the four-point measurement system? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you got current coming in on the outside. So I don't know, current would come in on the outer points here. Mm -hmm. And then you have sense wires here and here. Okay. So and so you know, heavier gauge for the current coming in, and then low low uh, smaller gauge copper wires at the sense points so that you don't, so those wires are concerned for leaking heat out of the trace. And so you want to have small diameter wires to measure the voltage drop across a six inch length of the trace. And so the idea is that the whole trace is, uh, you know, at some, well, first off at steady state temperature for a given current level, and that you're not influencing the trace too much by coming in three inches on each side from where the source wires are. And so you, you're essentially getting an average from you know, each of the sense points across that trace, but it, there, there's a small, very small gradient. So you're getting as close to a true temperature of the trace as you possibly can following you know, that method. Interesting, very cool. And looking at uh, thermal images of the, the traces, there, there wasn't much of a gradient. You see a small little variation where the wires are for the sense wires, you see a little bit more where the source wires were, are, uh, but very small gradient. And we uh, shared some of that information in IPC 2152 in the appendix as well, so that people get a sense of what the gradients look like uh, around the traces. All right, so let's go back to that presentation. This one uh, or the other one, sir? This one's good. So what we did, uh, we were, our goal was to create a matrix of uh, charts from you know really thin, really small boards to really thick, really large boards, and do that for various material sets. Uh, what we ended up doing is you know, we tested 17 different boards, varying thickness, and then we 
had we created 51 more charts. And of those, they varied from three by three, five by five, seven by seven, 10 by 10, 14 by seven are the standard boards. And then we even did one 14 by one. Uh, hmm. There was a guy uh, from the company Schlumberger that was at our meeting and he was talking about these thin boards that they put down in the oil wells. And I just thought it was so interesting. I went and made a chart for him and he never came back to the meeting. So I was never able to give him any of this information. Oh, but I know. Right. Uh, so anyway, we did internal and external traces uh, with and without copper. And we, uh, we looked at one ounce and two ounce copper planes. We varied the distance from the planes to the traces and uh, just collected all that data. And so what I'll do is I'll share some of that data here in the next couple of charts. And I wanna use, I wanna illustrate the importance of the parallel conductor heating. So <clears throat> that board that I showed you earlier with the serpentine trace on it. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the last boards that we tested uh, when I was still working with IPC in the 1-10B task group. We did that, I think, in 2016 or so. And there's a, for anyone that's an IPC member, there's a report out there that discusses uh, that whole test and all the data that we collected for it. And I'll, I'll show you some of that here. Uh, and the, we, what we're going to look at are two different boards. That one that I showed you had, a cop, had four one-ounce copper planes in it. And there was another configuration where it's just the serpentine traces with no copper planes. So we get to compare those two. I never made design charts for that configuration, but what we'll do is we'll just look at some data and then compare how these different charts, if you're calculating the temperature rise, uh, how they would compare. And so we'll, we'll take a look at that next year. Okay. All right. Well, unfortunately, Got some overlap on the translation of PowerPoint here, but that's okay. Uh, what we're looking at here is just a single 10 mil uh, one ounce trace. And the, uh, the trace is set up to run just one amp. Okay, so we're looking at the temperature rise of a 10 mil trace, one ounce copper. Okay. I'm with you. All right. And so if you were to go to IPC 2221 and look at one amp, what you'd find is that you'd get 108 degrees C temperature rise. That's insane. Well, the thing that is difficult there is that if you don't know the history behind this, these design charts, you wouldn't know that the design chart for internal traces in IPC 2221 is just half the current from the external trace chart. It's not from data that was collected. And that had the whole community really confused for a long time until it surfaced through the research that we did and finding the original data, uh, and then also comparing it with the equations that were being used to define 2221 charts. And you'll see a factor of 0.5 on them and the same equation. So it's pretty obvious once you take a look at them. So as an engineer, if I'm looking at that, though, if I'm looking at 108 degree rise, I was like, that's unacceptable. I'm going then to make the decision to go to heavier copper and wider traces. And that's yeah. a bad decision. Well, it's not in your best interest. It's probably good for global warming in that <laughs> you're going to be, you know, using less energy. So there's there's a good side, you know, go green, <laughs> go green and go big on your, on your exercises. <laughs> So for all of those that out there designing to be green, stick with the internal charts from IPC 2221. <laughs> but if you really want to know what the temperature rise is, you got to do a little bit more homework. And so at least with 2152 and knowing that, you know, you got a board that's 14 by seven, it's suspended in air, which, you know, you, and it has no copper planes, uh, you're going to find that you've got a 12 degree C rise for that same size trace. And then uh, if you, so on these next two, these are computer generated. Well, yeah, both of them are computer generated design charts. Uh, the first one 
it's a little bit warmer. And as we talked about earlier, the thinner boards run a little hotter, right? Mm -hmm. We saw that. And so from, you know, and here we've got FR4 versus polyimide. How much of a difference is there between the dielectric materials? Well, the polyimide is, it has a thermal conductivity that's a little bit better, but it's not the main driver between the four degree C difference that we see there. The, the ma main difference is because the board's thinner. And then there's a, a, an additional factor of the fact that the, the uh, board is FR4 versus the polyimide. And then if you put a copper plane that's just five mils away from that trace, and this copper plane is, you know, throughout the whole board. So the copper plane is five inches by five inches. It's one ounce copper, but just five mils away, that drops that 16 degrees C down to four degrees C. Wow. So if you can get your copper planes as close to the traces as you possibly can without, you know, violating any kind of uh, voltage or current rules, then what you see is a significant drop in its temperature because now you've got something that the energy is conducting down to that plane and spreading and then the uh, energy has an opportunity to get up into the rest of the board to help convect and, and radiate away. And now if you tie that copper plane to your mounting points, whether it be wedge locks or, or bolted fasteners, if you can create a pathway from that copper plane to the, your mounting points, then you can even lower it even more and significantly more. Unfortunately, hmm. I don't have any cases to show you, but I mean, that's the general, that's, that's where it's going to go. You have to go out and prove it to yourself now. So. <laughs> Would this be of any use? Oh, that's your uh, test board. Yeah, well, absolutely. You know, the, why, why do you have boards mounted in hardware, right? I mean, for one, it has to hold the board, right? Yep. But it's also a heat transfer path for the energy leaving that board. And, it creates a path out. Now, your board might have, uh, you know, fans pushing air through it as well. But the uh, the designs that I primarily worked with had wedge locks. That, okay. You know, crank that surface down to a, an aluminum chassis. And that chassis is bolted down to a, a heat sink where the energy is dumped to. And so that's where it, you see the, the most significant impacts is when you've got a really hard heat transfer path for it to follow. I brought out a heat sink too for you, Mike, if you need it. <laughs> okay. So now let's take a look at the parallel traces. We'll look at these same uh, configurations. Uh, so here we've got, what well, we're gonna compare seven traces. They've got, a, it's, they're all laid out 10 mil line and space. So each trace is 10 mils wide and the spacing between each trace is 10 mils. There's seven of them. And the rule in the standards for sizing parallel conductors is that you add up all of the, the trace widths, and then you size that for the total current. So we're, we're running one amp through each of the traces. Okay. And we sum all of those traces, so you get 70 mils. So we size the trace for 70 mils at seven amps. And we look at IPC 2221, and for an internal trace, 70 mils at seven amps, it tells you you're gonna be 365 degrees C. You're burning again, it up. Well, you know, and it is what it is. It's, when you understand it, it's, you know, it, well, and here's a side note for you. The, there is, if you go back, and we're not going to do that here, but for people that are listening to this, if you go back to that chart that I showed with the original data, there's traces that were taken off the board and powered up in, in air by themselves, mm -hmm. not attached to the board. And those actually uh, correspond very close to the uh, internal trace chart. From really 2221 20, so That's there is value yeah so a trace with no insulation on it just in the air will run about that temperature so if you have a 70 mil trace put seven amps through it and you get it up to about 365 <laughs> now that is interesting yeah. so that's going back to this chart then yeah so that bottom curve there uh, can you see my mouse 
Um, I can't. I don't know if the so, viewers can or not. See that? See that bottom line? Can you? Uh -huh. Can you? I don't know if you can move your mouse over that. I can try it. Uh, Do you see mine? Nope. Okay. So anyway, the, the so the bottom line, and on the left hand side in that that table, you'll see that there's a uh, a note in there, and it says "removed from core." And that's what they meant by it. They removed it from the board and they tested it just in air. And I think what they were concerned about is that if the, the trace had lifted off the board, uh, what would its temperature be? And so they wanted to get an idea, had a trace lifted, you know, they were having a hard time adhering to the board materials back then. Okay. And so uh, by knowing what kind of limits you have, uh, that, that was the intention. Interesting. Yeah, it really is. I, I, that's fascinating. I, know, I, like, I like it too. That's what got me going on all this. Okay, <laughs> so we'll step on through. So that, and then, so back, we've got seven traces represented by one 70 mil trace, seven amps. And if you were going to IPC 2152 and size it, you get a 68 degree C rise. Then, Go ahead. Let me stop you for one second. So we're talking parallel traces. I just want to be clear for our viewers at home. Are we talking these things are stacked on top of each other or these things are side by side? In this case, they're side by side. But it would be the same way if they're stacked up, especially in, in this case. You know, what we're going to compare against are traces that are uh, 10 mils in separation side by side. So that could easily be 10 mils of separation top to bottom. All right. Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead, sir. Uh, keep bringing those things up. I think it's all good. Uh, so then if we go to the trace chart we created and we talked about before, the 038 thick FR4 boards, five by five, uh, we know that that runs a little bit hotter than 2152. And sure enough, we come up with a 98 degree C rise. Uh, and the other thing that you want to keep in mind is that with parallel conductors, and what we're doing right now is sizing a single trace, right? You know, seven amps, 70 mil trace. When you've got the 10 mil separation or any separation as you spread them apart, they, as you separate them, they cool, the overall temperature is gonna be cooler just because that power is not all on top of itself. Because of the separations, there's gonna be some cooling effect. And that cooling effect is addressed in 2152 as well by looking at the gradients around a single trace. In hmm. a steady state condition, when you have a temperature gradient in a known configuration, like what we're talking about, a design chart that would be for a you know, specific technology, when you define that gradient, those gradients are additive. So if you just start stacking up these gradients on top of each other, you can add up all of these, these temp delta Ts to come up with a summation that would show you the overall final temperature for multiple inputs. It's and that easy? You just superimpose them? For steady state, yeah. Interesting. I know. And, and that's why I was excited to try to develop these tools because I envisioned, so the calculator was phase one. I had a phase two process or phase two software development that I wanted to do. And, it was basically just going to work with those uh, gradients, uh, and then a graphical way to present it. You know, but all right, moving on. So then, if we look at just the the configuration with uh, the 038 thick board with the one ounce copper plane, that 70 mil wide trace, seven amps, is a 24 degree C rise. Still a little a little much, uh, but doable. Well, when you're comparing to uh, 68 or 365, it's a pretty it is, significant It is difference. a big improvement, yeah. And it's good to know that that's the kind of impact that you can see when you have copper planes in your board, which most people do. <laughs> you should, yeah. And so now what I'd like to do is illustrate, you know, how the temperature rise is lower than that. You know, even though, you, so you've got this rule, right? You sum up all the, the conductor widths and uh, you apply all the current and 
and that's supposed to give you, so if you're designed that 70 mil wide trace for a 10 degree C rise, um, you would see that you have to lower the current, you know, by some amount. But if you've got copper planes in your design, then you got some additional margin there. Do you design with that margin or do you, you know, design right to your margin? I know a lot of people that are out there really pushing their designs, trying to save money. And there's no way for them to really know what they have until they've already laid out their entire design and then evaluate it. And even then, it's a tough problem to go in and look at all your traces turned on at the same time. It's not happening. So uh, it's, it's a complex problem, even in the post-design side, to get good, accurate temperatures for your traces. And most of the tools, you have to almost do everything independently or tri one trace at a time. Uh, and it's just not all that great a process in my mind. So what I wanted to bring us to are these last two boards that we tested uh, in IPC. And it's the polyamide boards, one uh, with copper planes and one without copper planes. And so when we power up these seven traces in that serpentine pattern, right? So all seven traces with the 10 mil line in space, we get a 53 degree C rise. So now I lean a little bit toward, so one thing, it's an 06 thick board, okay? Okay. And the, and the board's a little bit smaller than the 2152. The 2152 is 14 inches long, seven inches high and 07 thick. And this one is eight inches by six inches and 060 thick. So the thinner board is going to run a little hotter, and uh, but probably not all that much. So the majority of the uh, difference in temperature, that 68 to 53C, most of that is probably due to the, the 10 mil spacing, hmm. I think. And then, unfortunately, the design, the team that uh, decided on this board. I only wanted to add one copper plane to the board. Uh, I got overruled, even though as a chairman, I could have dictated, but I, I'm not like that. Uh, they wanted to put in four one ounce copper planes. And the problem with four one ounce copper planes is you don't get to see the influence of each one of the planes. And that's where the computer modeling comes in really handy. You can you know, start removing planes and seeing you know, what the impact of each one is. Obviously, the ones that are closest to the trace are doing the most work. The ones furthest away are doing the least. But you don't see how much of an impact, you know, the second, third, and fourth copper plane really have on reducing the temperature rise, especially when you take a look at on that 5x5 five five board, the 038 thick, you know, how big, big a drop it takes there in, in trying to come up with a, a delta T. So... Well, Mike, I, I was just going to say the only reason to have power is to let it go to your head. So next time, Bigfoot them. <laughs> and, and so in the last test that we did with the copper planes, you know, from 53 down to 14. So 14 degrees C, that's still suspended in air for, you know, seven, you know, basically seven amps. It's just one amp running through each of them. But uh, it gives you a good sense of how much margin exists in the design of electrical conductors and printed circuit boards. And when people need to know what those temperatures are, don't just go to these uh, standards thinking you're gonna get a good number for your designs. You're gonna have to do a little work before you're gonna get some decent numbers to work with and actually simulate what you've got in your designs. Unless you have boards that ha don't have copper and they're suspended in air. <laughs> No, that's, that's an excellent point. So you can't just go to the standard and look something up. You need to know what you're looking at. Um, that's true for a lot of data. Yeah, I agree. So I think that's the, the, pretty much the message I wanted to bring across. I don't think I have any more slides there. Maybe one. I can check for you. Oh, that was just a picture of the test setup in those boards that I showed you earlier. Yeah. And right. yeah, that was your presentation. 
Well, Mike, that's that is a wealth of information and a wonderful wrap up to the story. Um, and I, I sure do hope engineers find this video and watch it and, um, you know, are able to apply this to their designs. So all that extra data, what happens to it now? Pass it on to my grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if anybody finds this in the future, would you be willing to, you know, share that with them so that they could do something with it? Uh, or is that something that you consider, you know, work product um, from your company? I'm always open to talking about things. I, I have a lot of, between myself and the software company I worked with, we invested a lot of time and money. And Got it. To recoup that, you know, if, if I were to receive anything, I would be obligated. I, I own everything and I have no debt on it but I would still want to give a portion to the software company. And so uh, that would all come into the discussion. And so if people really wanted to access it versus just go out and create their own, uh, then, you know, it'd be open for discussion, but those are some of the caveats that would be a part of that. Well, no, I mean, running a company and buying all those boards, it's a significant expense. And um, I, I certainly think you should receive compensation for that if, you know, if somebody just wanted the data. That makes a lot of sense. Um, at the same time, I think the industry desperately needs more thermal engineers. Uh, I haven't, in my limited travels, and I am still relatively new to the industry, I haven't really met anybody with your particular skill set or even close to it. Um, I've met a lot of engineers that have thermal issues in their designs, but they have no clue how to solve them and they have no clue who to turn to. So for anybody out there who's looking for a niche, you know, I get rich quick, become a thermal design consultant and, you know, the money's just going to come piling in, you know, <laughs> fast, fast cars, big houses, you know, fat stacks of cash, you know, become Mike Jupy. Uh, by the way, this is all fake money. Uh, this is for movie you sold me. I'm not actually rich. No. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> sorry. Mike, sorry. don't tell him that. <laughs> it's not <gonna> work. <laughs> You're ruining my sales pitch, buddy. <laughs> well, hey, uh, do we have any questions out there in TV land? Um, I, I'm I'm concerned that that was a little too much to take in in the time that we presented it, it might be something that you need to take a look at the slides and digest and come back with. But for the people that I see online that are watching, if you do have any questions for Mike, uh, please feel free to share them now. I'll, I'll leave the lines open for a moment or two. Just leave them as comments below your video and they should come my way uh, automatically through StreamYard. And just to recap, uh, we started this journey looking at thermal analyses, analysis then Mike went to Hackaday and did a hack chat and he met a friend who had a lot of energy in his board or thermal energy. And, you know, Mike was looking at how to deal with that and a very, very useful webinar on first order approximations of V accounts, thermal vias. That was a great one. And now we're here. It's been a wonderful journey. Um, and I can't thank you enough for your valuable insight and valuable time, Mike. Um, it's really been great. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Mark. I, I like being able to get the word out. And uh, if you hear anybody whining about 2152, tell them to do their homework. There's no reason to whine about it. They should only be happy because they don't have to do all the work that we already did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then then I'll Just, I don't use know. it for what its purpose is. I'll pie him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm. no, um, I spent a couple years just trying to trying to tell people to stop using the online calculators that were all based on 2122. Once 2152 came out and I learned that 2020, it, is it 2221? And I keep saying 2122, yeah. don't I? I'm sorry, 2221. I'm sorry. 2152, you got it. I got it backward. So 2221 is horribly over conservative. You're going to end up making boards that are bigger than they need to be using more copper than you need to use, which is why you guys did your work on 2152. And even then, we're only seeing 
really the beginnings of a picture to form. And and that's where your the rest of your stuff came in. So Mike, we're not getting any questions in, buddy. We either explained it beautifully or we scared people. And I know which one I'm voting for. <laughs> Well, Mark, again, thank you very much. It's awesome meeting you, and it's been a lot of fun. Mike, man, um, I just wish that our careers overlapped more. Uh, it, it would have been a blast working with you. So, well, thank you I'm so sure much, Mike. Um, we will make all of these posts available, um, all of the slides available at royalcircuits.com slash blog or AAPCB dot com forward slash blog within a couple days here. Uh, the, the person who does that or who has access to that account is out sick, unfortunately. So as soon as they come back, we'll get that going. If you have any board design needs or you have a need for an expert like Mike, please feel free to contact sales at aapcb.com or sales at royalcircuits.com. Uh, that blog, very soon that's going to be Summit Interconnect, but for now it's still Royal as far as I'm aware of. Uh, contact your salesperson, they'll get in touch with me, and then we'll work out an arrangement with Mike to bring him to your engineering team. If he's available, Mike will compensate you. Um, and that can be part of our free engineering services for your team. So um, you guys aren't out of pocket. Um, Mike's not out of pocket. I'm not out of pocket. I never spend my money. I can't because it's fake. Um, <laughs> but we'll we'll make we'll make whatever you need work for your team. I'd like to thank RoyalCircuits.com and AAPCB.com and Summit Interconnect for sponsoring this webinar today, and especially a huge thanks to Mike Jupy for everything. With that, thank you all. Have a great day.